What I'm going to talk about today is uh, a radical alternative to the Big Bang inflationary model. So a lot of what you've been hearing about during the course of this festival has been a celebration of inflation. You're going to hear the other side of the story today and then the uh, possibility of a radical alternative. So a key difference between, um, uh, between these two different ideas is, has to do with um, the story of the overall history of the universe. In the Big Bang inflationary picture, there's a well-defined beginning of time and space, which we call the bang. And there's effectively an end to the universe when dark energy takes over and matter as we know it is so dissipated that there's essentially no observable matter in the universe. And I want to contrast that with the alternative picture that I'm going to talk about today, which you can think of as truly an endless universe in which space and time exist forever into the past and forever into the future and which stars, galaxies, presumably sentient beings, appear and reappear over and over again through the history of this endless universe, all occurring within the same region of space that we are occupying today. So this is a radical alternative to the inflationary picture. Max gave a beautiful explanation of the inflationary picture as you conventionally see it in textbooks. And if you follow that picture and you follow the beautiful story he gave, the first question you might have is, why look for an alternative when you have a theory that works so beautifully? And my answer to that question is very simple. It's because, actually, the inflationary paradigm has failed. That's what we've really learned over the last 30 years. Not only has it failed, but we've known about the flaws in the picture for nearly 30 years, some of them as much longer than 30 years. And some of us have been struggling with those flaws and seeing if we could fix them. But after 30 years, what we've learned from that is that the flaws are worse than we thought and are really potentially fatal flaws. In fact, probably fatal flaws. So that the nice picture that um, Max presented is maybe the textbook picture that would appear in texts and in newspapers and the like. But it ignores these fatal flaws. We kind of agreed I should say, and I'm putting Max on the spot here, we kind of agreed to divide up our story this afternoon in this way. So we could, um, you could see both uh, views of the picture. So you might ask yourself then, if we've known about these flaws for 30 years, why are we still talking and even giving awards for and celebrating this inflationary picture? Well, I think the simple answer to that is, uh, this myth of inflation, the picture that Max gave you, sounds so compelling, you, have to, you almost have to believe that it's got to be true. You can't believe you can't fix the flaws because the story sounds so simple and so compelling. It only requires, it seems, like a single ingredient, some, this form of energy that uh, Max described as non-diluting or what I'll call here inflationary energy. There has to be some source of inflation en energy that somehow occupies most of the energy in the universe in the first few instants after the bang, and that drives the universe into this accelerated expansion. And there are various candidates for what form this inflationary energy might take, and it's not going to be so important for what I'm going to describe today which particular example I'll choose. But I'll choose a very conventional example that you'll see in most textbooks and, and most discussions, and that's of a, of a field called the inflaton, um, which um, is just a name for a hypothetical field yet to be described, yet to be explained. And this field has a strength. Everywhere in space it has a value or strength, which can, uh, and depending upon that strength, depending upon its value, that determines how much energy there is in a given volume of space which contains that field. Now, we don't actually know that this inflaton exists, and we don't actually have a detailed theory of what, how its energy varies with the strength of the field. So, but we're allowed to just hypothesize possibilities. And the hypothesis that you need in order to have inflation would be, well, one of a set of curves such as the one shown in this example. So we'll go with this example. Now you'll see there's a point on the curve over to the right where the energy reaches zero. That is, uh, that's the bottom of the curve. So if the field comes to rest there, that's the lowest energy state that the field can reach, and there's no energy that it contains. That would describe the state of the universe today, according to the inflationary picture. It should lie today at the bottom of this hill in this valley. Uh, but in order to drive inflation, we have to have a situation where at the beginning of the universe, 
After, right after the bang, the field was not lying there, but it was instead lying at some state of higher energy. It could be to the left, as I've shown it with that little ball. It could be to the right, way up on the right. You've seen different pictures in the course of this weekend or in the course of other readings you might have had on inflation or in Max's talk as to what shape the curve might have and where the field might lie. But in all the examples, the field lies at some point of higher energy. It's uniform in space, and it's sitting there almost at rest. When you have all those conditions met, then you can have inflation start. What happens if it's sitting there almost as rest is that the energy contained in that field quickly takes over all the other forms of energy. That is to say, the other forms of energy dilute as the universe expands, while what happens as the universe expands is you create more space, which contains more of this field, which has this large energy in it, which just drives faster expansion, which then creates more space, containing more of this field and more expansion. And there's kind of a runaway process that maintains itself as long as the field remains perched on that hill. But the field can't remain perched on the hill if it has a, 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 that shape. Because just as a ball, if it were perched on that hill, would eventually roll its way down, the equations which describe the evolution of that field obey similar equations. They would roll down that plateau until they finally reached the bottom of the hill, at which point there would be no more energy left in the field, and inflation would come to an end. That's the way the story is supposed to go. And then the energy that was originally contained in this field as it rolls down the hill, first of all, becomes kinetic energy. The field oscillates very rapidly around the bottom of the hill. And then that oscillatory energy uh, decays into matter and radiation that we observe today. That's the conventional inflationary story. And then from that, from that if you allow that, those ingredients in the early universe, then from that is supposed to come a number of marvelous things that comprise what I call the inflationary myth. If you have that condition, then even if the universe begins in some arbitrary state coming out of the Big Bang, because we really have no idea what the initial conditions are coming out of the Big Bang, there's no particular reason why the universe should be uniform or, should have any, uh, or shouldn't have be highly curved or, cur or highly warped. No matter how, what the conditions coming out of the Big Bang, any sort of chaotic initial state, inflation, by its stretching the universe very, very fast, is supposed to spread out those non-uniformities and curvatures and warps, leaving a universe which is uniform and flat, taking it from a chaotic initial state to a highly ordered final state, number one. Number two, it explains a number of things about the universe, according to the myth. It explains the uniformity and the flatness, for example, and what we call the isotropy, the fact that the universe looks the same when you look at it in different directions. And it predicts a lot. And Max talked about some of the predictions associated with inflation. For example, the distribution of hot spots and cold spots in the microwave background, their statistical properties, uh, and the existence of cosmic gravitational waves. So according to the inflationary myth, if you give me this one set of ingredients at the beginning of the universe, I can explain all this stuff and predict all this stuff. And if this myth were true, I wouldn't be here today talking to you about an alternative. But the problem with this myth is it's not true. Not one part of it, not a single part of it. It's not true that inflation transforms an arbitrary chaotic initial state into a, a final state. Uh, in fact, what we learned about inflation is that it only can start if you, if you already have, at the very beginning, very special conditions. I already hinted at them. Not only did you need that field, to exist. Not only did you need that special form of energy curve to exist, but you needed a region of space in which the field was perched at rest, nearly at rest, at the top of that hill, at the top of that plateau. Okay. Turns out that condition is extremely unlikely. As you go back in time, uh, well, I should say, first, as you go forward in time, one of the effects that happens in the universe due to the expansion is that kinetic energy or emotional energy transforms into gravitational energy. This is the reason why the energy of photons become redshifted. They lose energy as they go through an expanding universe. Or if you have particles traveling through the open universe, in an expanding universe, they will slow down due to the expansion of the universe. Their energy will be converted into gravitational, and their kinetic energy will be uh, converted into gravitational energy. That means going backwards in time, the opposite happens. If you want to go backwards in time, kinetic energy increases. Motional energy increases as you go back in time. 
So in particular, this field also has motional energy. Its value changes with time. That has a kind of kinetic energy associated with it. So when you go back in time, what happens is this kinetic energy rises much faster than any other form of energy, including the energy of that energy curve. So instead of being at rest on that energy curve, the likely initial conditions of the universe are much more likely that the field value is changing at some fantastic rate. It spends almost no time at all, if any at all, uh, at that plateau. We can use various methods to approximate or estimate what the likelihood is that we actually got those inflationary conditions. Assuming random chaotic initials coming out of the Big Bang, what's the probability there's a substantial region of space where the field is perched on top of that hill? Now, theorists disagree exactly how to do this estimate. So I'm going to give you one result which uses what I would call standard statistical uh, mechanical reasoning, the same kind of reasoning they would use to reason, for example, what's the probability that all the atoms in this room will end up in the corner of that room an hour from now? If you use, we know how to do those kinds of estimates. If we use that kind of estimates here, and we ask what's the probability coming out of the Big Bang that the universe had, that, uh, had those special conditions, the answer would look, um, the answer would look something like this but one part in 10 to the 100 power. Now, 10 to the 100, that is one followed by 100 zeros. And some of you may know that that number has a name. It's called a Google. It's the same Google that, of the company Google, except you know, for pri proprietary reasons, they spelled it differently. They put an L-E at the end instead of the O-L. It's an extraordinarily big number. But the probability we're talking about here isn't one in a Google. It's one in 10 to the Google. So that means one followed by a Google zeros. That number, actually, that number. That number has a, number, has a name, too. It's called a Googleplex. And something I just learned when I was looking up what a Googleplex was, just to make sure I would got that right, it was that one over a Googleplex also has a name. I didn't know that before. Maybe you did. It's called a Google, Google Minix. Now, I have never seen in science before a Google Minix actually play a physical role. But in this theory, inflationary theory, the probability of inflation beginning is less than a Google Minix by this reasoning. So you have a theory which only works if you have the right conditions. But the, getting those right conditions is extraordinarily unlikely and likely to a level that is unimaginably small, unlike anything we've ever seen before in science. That means if you claim that this theory explains why the universe is uniform, it only explains it, provides you first explain why you got those, uh, those unusual initial conditions. So, in fact, what I'm telling you is something that even some of the best, propo strongest proponents of inflation now agree to. They concede that we don't understand the initial conditions that would lead to inflation. And they concede that, in fact, inflation, therefore, it's not clear yet until we can explain those initial conditions, that it actually solves the horizon and flatness problems for which it was designed to solve. We actually have no way, no logical way of, anymore of making that argument, given what I just told you and given what we've learned.